Okay, I think um, I think we'll get this started. Um, I'm going to spotlight Callan to introduce this for us. And Callan, you are on. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to welcome everyone to the final talk in this series and share a thanks to everyone for joining and for their participation on Zoom here over the last few weeks. All of your attendance and excellent questions have been very appreciated. And we really look forward to launching our website within the next month or two. So please stay tuned because that's where you'll be able to learn more about everything that we're up to. And we'd also like to share that Freedom of Mind will be hosting three online retreats with Delson coming this fall. Signups aren't currently available quite yet, but just so that you can mark your calendars, the tentative dates will be September 13th to the 21st, October 11th to the 19th and November 8th to the 16th. Each one will have about 15 slots and there will be daily interviews with Delson as well as recorded talks that all the participants can watch at their own convenience as they make their way through the retreat. And we'll send out emails a few months in advance with more details and sign up info. And uh, lastly, we just wanna thank everyone again for coming and we really, looking, we really look forward to staying in touch with everybody. Okay, thank you, Callan. So today's topic is forgiveness, and I'll invite Delson on to get it started. So forgiveness, this is um, this is the uh, as David was saying earlier, sometimes the dreaded word amongst the community. Every time somebody prescribes mm -hmm. forgiveness, it's like, uh, oh no, I've done something wrong. You know, I, I, I'm not progressing. But no, uh, you know, there's a there's a saying in Star Wars, you know, everybody, I, I love Star Wars. So one of the uh, one of the sayings is by Darth Vader. He says, uh, do not us underestimate the power of the dark side. Not that forgiveness is the dark side, <laughs> but I would say do not, for, you know, do not underestimate the power of forgiveness, right? Because it is very powerful. Um Bhante Vimaramsi, when he introduced this practice, he himself was doing this for about two years. And uh, when I met him uh, the first time, well, I'd say the second time you know, in Damasuka, uh, he recommended this book to me, which is a book by uh, Stephen Levine. It's called uh, Who Dies? Yeah, I have it over here. This is the copy I got from him. And... Uh, he had me read it uh, to get a better understanding of uh, this whole process as well. And if you actually go to that book, it's, I won't read it, but I'll let you know what page it is in on. It's on page 81 to 83. It talks about forgiveness. It talks about self-forgiveness and forgiving others. And so this is really the beginnings of how, how Bhante developed this and he spent some time, if I'm not mistaken, in Hawaii for a couple of years uh, practicing this forgiveness practice. Uh, when I was there at Damasuka and uh, Benbril Metananda was there as well, uh, every morning uh, Bhante and uh, Venerable Metananda would go through a exchange of forgiveness. And this is actually common uh, within the Bhikkhu Sangha, the Bhikkhu and Bhikkhuni Sangha, where uh, on every full moon night or on every Upasata day, uh, what they will do is they will confess any, you know, misdemeanors, any mistakes, any things that they might have done to cause harm intentionally. And they ask for forgiveness. Um, and then... It's as easy as the elders, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if I remember this correctly, saying that to a very good friend, uh, please do not do that again, friend. You know, And then uh, that's what Bhante and Venerable Metananda would do. Right? Venerable Metananda would be there for Bhante to tell him, and then uh, Bhante would be there for Venerable Metananda to tell him. So this forgiveness practice seems very simplistic. Yeah, and... We know that there are, let's say, multiple subtler versions of it, depending on when you joined this practice and how you understand it. I would say don't get too hung up 
uh, on the technique. Don't get too hung up on how to do it so much. Um, because, you know, the, the, the most recent one that Von David had introduced was just forgive and relax. So you would, you know, the way I uh, came across it was you use certain statements. You say, I forgive myself for not understanding. This is a very important thing to uh, remember when we say not understanding. <laughs> not understanding. <laughs> Not understanding means being in ignorance, right? Because ignorance is not understanding the Four Noble Truths. Ignorance is a lack of mindfulness. And so when we say not understanding, we're saying that we have not understood the Four Noble Truths in that moment. This is the deepest, one of the deepest layers of, un, of understanding this statement. I forgive myself for not understanding. And this is a statement you would repeat in your mind a few times, not like a mantra, but you would just say it a few times in your mind, and then you would just relax and wait and see what comes up. And it might take some time, and that's okay, but you're just there, available to the moment, available to whatever is arising. And whatever will arise then will be something that's like uh, either something you did, something you said, um, you know, something you feel bad about, some remorse, some regret coming up. And it's important not to relive the emotions of whatever happened. Yeah, It's okay. I mean, it happens. If you experience, relive the emotion, you experience remorse, you experience regret, you know, all of these things. Actually, the fact that you do experience remorse, the fact that you do experience regret, it, it's it's indicative of the fact that you do have empathy, right? So that's a step in the right direction. So anyway, so if you recognize something that feels off, that you did something uh, that makes you feel regretful, uh, you would just... Again, say, I forgive myself for not understanding. Or I forgive myself for hurting uh, this person. Or I forgive myself uh, for indulging in this. Whatever it was that arose in the mind. And the key there is that the forgiveness practice starts to release energetic blocks. Right. So the reason why we're giving the forgiveness practice is because somebody is not able to naturally feel loving kindness for themselves. In the interviews, the very first thing I ask people if they have problems with the practice is, do you feel like you deserve to be happy? And this is just the truth of the situation. A lot of people will say, no, I don't deserve to be happy. I don't think I deserve to be happy. And in that case, then I will tell them, I think you should do some forgiveness practice because forgiveness is all about self-acceptance first and acceptance of whatever has arisen in terms of somebody saying something to you or somebody saying something, doing something to you. So you will, in this practice, say, I forgive myself for not understanding. Something comes up. You allow it to be there. You forgive yourself. You accept it. And you drop it and it drops away. And how you know it drops away is that the emotional rawness of that experience that causes you mental suffering goes away. It's not like the memory goes away, but the emotional core of the memory is changed. It's replaced by a level of acceptance and equanimity. So if you go back to the experience and there was guilt before, now you realize, okay, that was a mistake. I've learned from that mistake and I have moved on. I can still remember that experience where I harmed this person in mind, body, or speech, but I have accepted it and I have decided to not repeat that offense again. And so I am leaving it be. That's what the uh, finality of this practice is for yourself. Now, eventually somebody will come up or you might say, I forgive you for not understanding. And you might say that a few times and you wait. And what will happen is somebody will come up. A situation will come up. 
uh, an experience, a memory of where this person hurt you in mind, body, or speech. This person said something untoward. You know, they were not understanding. They came from a level of ignorance. And they didn't understand in that moment that they themselves were suffering. And it was because they themselves were suffering that they were trying to inflict suffering on you. This is the ultimate understanding that you get. And so one of the fruits of the forgiveness practice is natural compassion for the other person. Now, a lot of people will say, well, does that mean that we have to then um, interact with that person? Does that mean we have to forgive them and talk to them? And, uh, you know, do we have to be all nice to them and all of these things? No. You know, there is that statement, forgive and forget. I think we should understand when we say forgive, we're just saying that we are forgiving that person because we want peace of mind. Everything that we do in this practice, whether it's forgiveness, whether it's metta, whether it's compassion, sending compassion to others, ultimately, it's for the benefit of our mind. It's for our peace of mind. It's for our freedom of mind. It's for our ability to be okay with the reality of every given moment. So when we forgive the other person, what we're saying is, I understand that in that moment you were ignorant. I understand in that moment you didn't know what you were saying in the sense that if you did know any better, chances are you would have behaved better. So I'm choosing to let go. I'm choosing to let bygones be bygones. But I don't have to interact with you. I don't have to, uh, you know, always put a smile on my face in front of you. If I can avoid you for the peace of my mind, not that I'm avoiding you out of aversion, but for my peace and your peace, I'm just letting you go and I'm not going to interact with you. That's okay. So forgiving means being okay with what that person did, but not having to forget. Yeah, what that means is you don't have to interact with, if you know that this person might be incorrigible or that person is still having some resentment towards you, if it was a mutually destructive relationship in that sense, then you don't need to be there to bring that up, to aggravate that again. And then the last part of that practice is where you, you are standing there, so to speak, when you're in your mind, and you see the other person looking back at you, and you receive forgiveness from them. Now, this, is, this doesn't have to happen all the time. It can happen, and it has happened for some people. But it is something that uh, helps to release further blockages, where you see the other person genuinely looking at you and saying, I forgive you. I forgive you for not understanding I am moving on. And that might help you to let go of situations where perhaps you can't communicate with that person, either because they're gone, or they're living in another country. Maybe they blocked you or you've blocked them or whatever it is. But ultimately, it helps you bring a better understanding of the situation. And it helps you have peace of mind. Because ultimately, that is the goal of the Dhamma, right? It's to have peace of mind in every moment so that you can see things as they actually are. What does it mean to see things as they actually are? It means that I am not projecting my biases onto the situation. I am not proliferating with all kinds of concepts and ideas and preconceived notions. Every moment is fresh in my mind. Every moment is fresh to me. Every person that I meet, even if I've had a relationship with them for 50 years, I don't have any projection of this is who they are. I don't, I don't plant into them some kind of an identity. I don't have any expectations. This is a 
obviously an ideal level of understanding of the Dhamma. But the forgiveness practice is a very important stepping stone towards that if you're not able to progress further in your practice. Sometimes what will happen is somebody is in the eighth jhana. Somebody is experiencing neither perception nor non-perception. But there is something that is always coming up in the form of formations, in the form of these proto-thoughts. And it's like they can't progress any further. It's like they've hit a wall. And it could be because they don't have enough disenchantment. It could be because they have uh, too many expectations, too much desire, that is to say, too much craving for Nibbana. And what I will recommend to them is, okay, just let that go. And do a little bit of forgiveness. Maybe for half a day. Just do some forgiveness. And when they do this, right, they'll come back to another interview and say, I've done this. I feel much better. I'll go back to, you know, the eighth jhana practice. I'll go back to quiet mind. And what they'll find is that they're at a much deeper level. Now, now their mind is much quieter. So forgiveness will always be needed until you become fully awakened. Because forgiveness is basically a tool in your toolkit on the way to final awakening. For somebody who is fully awakened, what is there to forgive? Forgive on what account? Right? There is no more identity. There is no more taking things personally. There is no more defending this way or that way. There's just whatever is happening in this moment. That is the perfection of the Dhamma. Being able to uh, allow things to be as they are, allow things to unfold as they would. So forgiveness is the preview of that. It helps you to see that. Now, sometimes what happens is people become, for lack of a better word, addicted. Just as you can be addicted to or obsessed with going into jhana, the first time, maybe the first couple of times when people do the forgiveness practice, they experience a great deal of catharsis. And I even warn people, you know, when you do forgiveness practice, you are going to cry, whether you want it or not, whether you like it or not, you are going to cry. Because it, it unleashes very gently, it brings to the forefront all of the subconscious pains, all of the different, um, you know, blocks that the mind is holding on to. And it's released in the form of crying. It's released in the form of tears. And tears are a good thing in this practice. It signifies that you are ready to let go, that indeed you are letting go. So, that's why I'll tell people, if you want to do the practice, you can do it uh, in, in your cabin or whatever it is and do it privately. If you feel like you're going to disturb other people, problem. But I'll tell you what, when people do this and they come back, they feel so much relief. They'll come back the next day and you will see it on their face. You know, they feel happy. They feel joyful. They feel a sense of uh, renewal a sense of revival. And then I'll know that they're ready for loving kindness again. And I'll ask them, do you feel like you want to continue with forgiveness or do you feel like you, you're you ready for loving kindness? And in that moment, they'll say, I feel like I'm ready to go back to loving kindness. And because they've released all of this gunk, all of this emotional turmoil that was plaguing them, the joy that arises in the form of piti becomes like a fountain yeah and it's like an un, unquenchable so to speak um fountain that keeps coming out it keeps giving you joy and so now you start to experience the first jhana and the second jhana and, and then you continue progressing as you would sometimes as i was just saying earlier people will get addicted to that though because they will uh, 
feel that joy and then they'll continue and they'll feel like, oh, the joy is diminished and now nothing's going on. Well, your mindfulness is sharper. You're experiencing more equanimity. So chances are you're getting to the third and fourth jhana. And then they'll come to a different retreat and they say, you know, I think I need forgiveness. And I'll say, okay, go ahead, do forgiveness. If you feel like you, you need it, spend the first two days doing it and they'll do it. And they'll be like, nothing's coming up. I, I want that release experience again. You know, they become addicted to that. They're like, I want to feel that catharsis again. That's actually an improper understanding of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not about, you know, you having to chase the experience of release. It's you being open to release. It's you being available to disturbing emotions and being okay with them. And then whatever comes up in the way of that release as crying or whatever, it comes about naturally. This is what I want you guys to know, whether it's forgiveness, whether it's practicing metta, whether it's quiet mind, whether it's trying to understand each of the jhanas and so on. Stop trying to make it an exercise. Stop trying to make it something where you want something out of it. When you become outcome driven and you become obsessed by it, then you're completely misunderstanding the situation. You're, you're not understanding the significance of what this is. The beauty and the magic of that release that arose, the beauty and magic of the jhanas that might have arisen when you're doing a regular practice is because you have no expectations. So when you had that experience the first time around, it was because you didn't know what to expect. And secondly, it was because you were genuinely open to the moment. You weren't waiting for something to happen. So if you want to experience release from forgiveness and you feel like you need forgiveness, do it. But don't be obsessed by the outcome. Like It needs to be done this way. It has to be this way. This has to, this should, this must. You know, this is what's known as masturbation. Yeah. This is uh, a term coined by Albert Ellis, who was the father of rational emotive therapy. And he talked about this. You know, people have a problem with how things are going in their emotional life. And people have a problem with the way people are interacting with them. And they have a problem with the outside world. It's this non-acceptance that these blockages. And they come in the form of these uh, words in your mind, yeah, which is like, I must do this. I have to do this. I should do this. This is just another kind of craving. It's a craving for existence. It's a craving for a certain kind of identity. It's an expectation that you put on yourself. And it's unfair for you. It's unfair for other people. And it's unfair for the world at large. Because it's unbeneficial for you. And it's unbeneficial for others. This is the way you know if something is wholesome or not. If it is wholesome, it's something that's beneficial for you. And it's beneficial for others. And the beauty of forgiveness is that it transcends any specific tradition. You will find forgiveness in all traditions, one way or the other. It has great psychological significance, great psychological relief for those. And people don't even need to follow anything in order to experience the benefits of forgiveness. You don't have to be a Buddhist. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be you know, Hindu, Muslim, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Forgiveness transcends all of that. And the other thing I'll say is forgiveness also stops karma. Now, what I mean by that is not that it somehow burns your karma, that it somehow takes all of the karmic residue and it just does away with it. No, it allows you to bring in some level of insight that sheds light on the situation so that you don't react in the same way again, 
causing that same karmic output. You know, I mean, this is the way the world is. This is the way samsara is. But can you just imagine if world leaders had this understanding of forgiveness? Unfortunately, in the world that we live in, that is just the nature of samsara. You know, people use forgiveness as lip service. Oh, yeah, I forgive him or I forgive them. Or let's not forget the power of forgiveness. And what do you know next? This world leader or that world leader stabs this person in the back, stabs that person in the back, does this, does that. All of these other things. We can't control that. But if on an individual level, people understood this, things would change. Things would really, really change. One of the biggest proponents of forgiveness was Jesus, Jesus Christ. He talked about forgiveness more than anything else when you read the New Testament. Right? Somebody said, somebody asked him, how many times should we forgive the same offense that somebody does? Seven times? How many times? And he says 70 times 70. 70 times 7. That's how many times you should forgive. Obviously, he was being a little you know, cheeky because what he's saying is just keep forgiving. Just let it be. Let it go. But he was one of the uh, best examples of forgiveness, being a personification, let's say, of forgiveness. You know, according to the Bible, right up until the moment of his death, he said, you know, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Right? What does that mean? He says, I forgive them for not understanding. They don't know what they're doing. So I'm choosing to forgive them. Now, we can't all be as great as Jesus or Buddha, but we can aspire towards that. And for our own benefit of personal relief and release, we can do it. Now, sometimes what will happen is, you know, the, the pent-up emotions that are present in, uh, you know, your energy system, as it were, can manifest as pains in the body. And sometimes what I'll recommend to people is you go to that pain if it arises and you say in your mind, I forgive this pain for being there. And you say that a few times and you wait and you will notice that that pain starts to unravel itself energetically. And what arises is this emotional memory. It might be something you said, something somebody else said. It could be some kind of trauma that was inflicted upon you or whatever it is. And now what you do is you deal with it in the same way you would with the regular forgiveness practice. You say, I forgive myself for not understanding. And you experience that. You let it go. You accept it. Or you see somebody else doing something to you and it has created this resentment, which has now manifested as this pain in the body. And so you take that resentment towards the person and you forgive them. You say, I accept what has happened. I forgive you. I'm choosing to let this go. And bit by bit, what you will see is because of those momentary experiences of relief that you experience less pain in the body. That particular pain starts to diminish. It starts to dissipate. So this can happen, you know, and, and so we always have to come with an attitude of forgiveness in this practice. Whether you're doing forgiveness or not, whether you're doing metta, compassion, whatever it is you're doing, always come with that attitude of forgiveness, which ultimately means, okay, I'm allowing things to be as they are. I'm accepting whatever is going on. Because in my introductory talks, when I give to people in, on retreat, well, the thing I say to them is, there's two things that people have to deal with. Oh, here are the balloons. I don't know if anybody else can see the balloons, but in any case, uh, these uh, situations arise where a person will say, you know, I can't feel the joy. I don't feel 
Like I deserve to feel the joy. I've already explained that part. The second is they're trying too hard. That's another side of the same coin. That's basically saying I'm choosing to push against the flow of reality. And I'm choosing not to accept that this is not happening right now. I'm going to push myself into a jhana. And that's the wrong way to do it. All you're going to do is cause yourself more pain. For a moment or maybe a few moments of extreme joy, you're going to push too hard and that can create problems. It can cause pain in the head, pain in the body. It can cause headaches. It can cause, you know, different kinds of energetic issues. So I urge all of you to not push hard. Do not try so hard. And if you find yourself doing this over and over, what do you do? You forgive yourself for it. You say, okay, I forgive myself for pushing so hard. I'm going to let that go. I'm going to take it easy. And so sometimes what Bhante would do, and sometimes what I will do, is I will tell the person, I want you to go, usually when they're at the retreat center at Damasuka in Missouri, I'll say, I want you to go for a walk. If it's too hot, I want you to find David or Kishan and take and have them take you to the lake and spend some time at the lake and just relax. Enjoy yourself. Don't do any practice. Don't think about metta. Anything. And what happens is because they're no longer caught up in the head of all of these thoughts, and I got to do this, I have to do this, I must do this, I should do this they are able to just live in the moment. Yeah, they find themselves enjoying seeing the lake, enjoying, enjoying seeing the birds, listening to the birds, enjoying the breeze, you know, just experiencing nature. And that in itself is the meditation. That in itself is understanding that the meditation is all about being here right now. That is the beginning of mindfulness, and it, it the fruition of that is a mind that is collected, not concentrated, not pushing, not trying too hard. So going back to this, forgiveness allows you to release those expectations that you put upon yourself. Now, you could go to a therapist. You can psychoanalyze all you want. Why do I feel this? You know, was it because I wasn't uh, you know, told I love you enough times? It was because, you know, my father did this, my mother did this, whatever it is. But we're not here to find out the why. We're not here to figure out why this happens. We're trying to figure out how this arises in the moment and how we can stop reinforcing it right, with our continual habitual tendencies. That is the wisdom aspect of this practice. We realize, okay, this is what we keep doing. Now there must be a different way. We let go of that. And we replace it with something that is wholesome. So the forgiveness practice reconditions the behavioral patterns from being a resentful person, from being a person who feels constant guilt and as a result, and as a, result a lot of anxiety and restlessness, to being a person that is accepting, to being a person that has some level of inner peace, and this is really the path of the Dhamma, seeing what is unwholesome, seeing that which is not beneficial for you and for others, choosing to let it go, and replacing it with something that is wholesome. And the wholesome will always be greater, more beneficial than the unwholesome. So there is a wonderful saying by this scientist by this thinker named R. Buckminster Fuller. And it's a great statement. He says, you don't change the existing reality by fighting it. Instead, you put a new model in its place so that the old one becomes obsolete. This is a very powerful statement. This is basically the Dhamma. You don't change the existing reality. What does that mean? You don't resist the Dhamma of this moment by pushing against it, by fighting against it. 
you replace whatever is arising in terms of your reactions and your responses to them with something else. And that only can happen when you have wisdom, when you have openness, when you have mindfulness, when you have the energy to use the six R's. But all of this can happen when you don't have these energetic blocks, these heavy sort of things that keep you, you know, cloud cloudy in your mind, that you're not able to experience what's going on. So forgiveness starts to clarify that path starts to clear the way so that you can see what's actually going on so that you don't have to take things personal really i mean all of the things that have been experienced the past that we experience i was uh recently in the mountains and i had a great discussion with some of my friends uh that i had met and one of this person was a beginner to the meditation practice and he said you know how do i how do I let go of all of these past resentments and all these past hurts? I mean, later on, I did prescribe him the forgiveness practice, but you know, from a from an understanding on the on the level of mind, I said, if you think about it, if you truly think about it, the past as it is doesn't exist in reality. It only exists in your mind, and it only persists because of your attention to it. But the only reality that we can experience is right here, right now. Even being right here, right now is still about maybe, I don't know, a fifth of a second or a tenth of a second, whatever, half a second in the past. We can't truly be here in the now because whatever you're experiencing is the feedback, is a reflection, of whatever your senses are picking up, picking up and whatever your mind is interpreting. So that can help a person understand that I don't have to cling to the past. It only exists so long as I choose to hold on to it. But as soon as I let it go, I'm no longer living in the past. And because I'm no longer living in the past, I don't have expectations that the future will be the same as the past. Because if you're truly here in the present, then you don't even care about the future. It doesn't matter to you what happens in the future. Not because you have some kind of um, craving for non-existence. It's just because you're so content in the present moment, as it were. You're so happy and fulfilled right here, right now, that whatever happens is just a natural unfolding of the Dhamma. And so that future being unconditioned or rather no longer conditioned by expectations rooted in past resentments, past hurts, past experiences in general is limitless. Anything can happen, but it doesn't tie you down with karma. These are the different kinds of insights that will come to you as an experience when you get deeper into forgiveness, you start to realize the value of being here. You start to realize, very bluntly speaking, the waste of time, so to speak, in continually reliving your past. You're wasting the opportunity to be in the present moment by utilizing it for reliving in the past. If that's happening, forgive yourself for that too. No big deal. It happens. The mind is a crazy machine. We have to accept that. And we just let it go. Now, I was talking to David offline about this, but at some point, somewhere, depends on the situation and if it makes sense, I will be introducing a another variation of the forgiveness practice, as if we don't have any, as if we don't have enough variations, right? But in any case, I'll put it out there. And if you're interested, you can check it out. Um, there are a couple of people beta testing it as it were. And uh, I'll have to get their approval before it's out there. It needs to have the twin stamp of approval before it can get out there. So uh, suffice it to say, though, it really helps with the energetics of the body. It really helps like 
purge a lot of stuff. Anyway, I won't keep uh, talking about it and try to sell it to you. Um, I'm going to open the floor for my very good and dear friend, Umberto, who I consider to be the meditator foremost in forgiveness, the master of forgiveness. Please, Umberto, take it away. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for giving me the uh, opportunity to, I guess, express uh, the value uh, that you do uh, get from uh, the forgiveness practice. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to, you know, uh, make this too kind of lengthy or anything like that because sometimes stories like this could get lengthy, but it's not really a need for that. Ultimately, I think the the practical uh, value that yeah, I can give throughout the story of mine that to get on this path uh, was that I wasn't even aware of what meditation was. I'm not, you know, really that uh, aware of a lot of those things with meditation, but uh, I was in a really dark place at one point in my life um, and uh, dark enough to say that I was ready to uh, take my own life. So kind of like in a fork in the road and um, I had children. So I thought to myself, you know, I can't really leave this kind of burden and so I had to find another option, another alternative. And, uh, you know, intuition and uh, something else guided me towards meditation. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet uh, this application called FitMind, uh, which I think we're kind of uh, familiar with here. Um, but FitMind was my introduction to meditation. And uh, I found it really practical and really easy uh, to start off with like five minute module and then six minute module. And that was amazing. Uh, it allowed me to start kind of like unwinding a bit. I would have to say that, you know, to get into that dark place uh, where I was, I was caused to a lot of trauma, earlier early trauma. And that's something that we kind of stick to, where we do take really personal. And as we take it personal, uh, we say, oh, man, like, you know, this is something that uh, is affecting me. And, you know, it's, it's making a change in my life. Well, uh you know, I found the forgiveness practice uh, that Bonte was teaching through the FitMind application. I found Thomas Suka and uh, Bonte through the FitMind application, through a podcast that Liam had. And then I was like, okay, cool. I get to, you know, actually see where this came from, where this practice came from. And I went to go uh, to Thomas Suka and, you know, and also through the YouTube channel, I, I really got a chance to really focus on it. Right. And, um, you know, it was a practice that I really had to learn how to make it, that I would do it every single day. Because um, as Dawson mentioned, you know, you tend to create this story of like, oh, I'm taking this personal. And uh, because of that, you have to really sit down every single day and go, what am I actually taking personal? What is the situation? I would have to say when I started meditating, also, I found it really difficult to do it. Um, I couldn't sit still for five, 10 minutes. I couldn't sit through meditation for more than like three or four minutes. So what that was, honestly, was all these resentments and regrets that I had created this story about. And through those resentments and regrets, I really had to sit down and go, okay, I really need to sit down and, and these things that were coming up. So the mind actually made it pretty easy to see these moments and go, oh, okay. Uh, so I got to focus on forgiving that. There's a big portion of the fact that, you know, we create all these little stories and we have to forgive not just all these situations that happen to us in our life, but we have to forgive ourselves, obviously, you know, uh, through this also. And that's a big portion of it. Now, going through those meditations and through those practices, um, there was watershed moments. I would have to say that when I got to Damasuka, I was lucky enough to meet Delson there. And he had a, a, one of his talks uh, initially that I saw, the first one, was at Damasuka, and it was on Majim Nikaya uh, 9, right view, and dependent origination through like the Four Noble Truths, which is pretty much amazing because that's the whole practical application of what we're doing here. When I heard that talk, forgiveness became a thousand percent easier. Because I realized 
that none of this was personal, that all of it was just cause and effect and strings of processes that were happening. And that I was just taking it personal. And then, of course, I could hear Vontae in my ear now going, you're taking it personal. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it was it became really easy. Uh, I knew, now I knew that the storylines that were happening. And you could even say to yourself, well, you know, take this person out of the equation and somebody else was in that equation. Would it still happen? Chances are because this person, those people are stuck in that habitual tendency, has nothing to do with you. It's not personal. When you could see yourself through that also, notice that sometimes you're causing pain to people. You don't even get it because you're just going down the path of a habitual tendency that you, you know, uh, have conditioned yourself into and really believing. <laughs> you go, oh man, this is easy to forgive. Because it has nothing to do with me, nor did I really mean to do those things to the, those people. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I now every day, I still do forgiveness practice every day because every day I, I do, and I'm not saying I do it for like an hour every day, maybe like 30 minutes or so, but I do make it part of my practice because on a constant basis, we do engage, if, especially if you're in the lay, in the lay community, you engage with a lot of people. And you don't realize that how a small inter interaction with somebody could cause you to hold on to resentment or regret something you might have done, something you might have said to someone, right? Those things, you know, like the Dhammapada says, you know, like uh, we learn that in, in Dhammasukha every morning too, you know, he abused me, he, he attacked me, you know, you made this person, you know, like this attacker, you know, if, if you harbor those thoughts, you know, Hatred's not appeased. If you do harbor it, you don't say anything. You don't react with these um, emotions. You don't react with these causes that you're actually creating yourself. Then hatred's not appeased. Love, you know, and that's the biggest portion also that I, uh, the biggest insight that I learned from forgiveness also is that when you, and it's the same thing as the six R's and the Brahma Vihars, you're bringing up this feeling of compassion you're bringing up this feeling of forgiveness and you share that feeling of, for, of compassion and forgiveness. And that's the same thing we're doing, right? We're projecting that love. So it's, 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 uh, it's practical. It's a uh, really good value to it. I would have to say that, you know, how do I know this is a great practice? What's well, the, the changes that it makes in your personality in the, in, you know, who you are. Um, I would have to say that prior to the meditation and twim, um, I was an angry person. I would say I was a violent person. Um, I would say that, you know, all of that was part of the the character and, and the, you know, that I uh, made myself into. Like, I'm angry. I'm a victim. Um, I hear Bonte right now going, if you're depressed, you're really selfish. <laughs> um, you, you make a change because you really come to terms with the fact that it's all, you know, part of something that, is the cause and effect and uh, part of like the de dependent origination, which is kind of interesting uh, to actually see. So, um, you know, uh, being on this path, I, I changed my life. Um, I'm able to, you know, uh, pretty soon become uh, fully integrated into uh, the Sangha uh, and really content about that. Uh, but, you know, you can, it's, it's a great practice that I think should be, um, experienced on a daily basis thank you thank, thank you Alberto. hey delson could you uh just go through the instructions re really quickly one more time just yeah. kind of once we've now yeah. we've talked about it so so the practice is very simple uh you sit down in a very comfortable position whether it's in the chair or on a cushion or whatever close your eyes and you relax for a bit and the way I remember it, as far as my version of it from understanding it from Bhante's videos, has been that you start off with a statement, I forgive myself for not understanding. And you say that a few times, not like a mantra, maybe four or five, half a dozen times. And then you just wait and see what happens. Something might come up. Some uh, resentment might come up, some guilt might come up, some remorse might come up, some memory might come up, 
situation that you were involved will come up. And all you do there is, again, you say that statement in your mind. I forgive myself for not understanding. Sometimes people want to say, I forgive myself for having caused pain to this person. Or I forgive myself for having caused pain to myself. Or for not realizing. Or whatever it is. But, you know, try to stick to the original. I mean, that's always pretty much overarching for all experiences. Uh, so you start with that. And you will feel a catharsis. You will feel something coming up. You will feel tears welling up. And if they come, they come. Allow them to be there. Now, after you let go of that, perhaps there's a person that has hurt you, has said something to you, has done something to you, has created a situation for you where it was unpleasant for you. It was uh, painful for you. It was harmful for you. And you have that person, you don't bring them up. You would just say, I forgive you for not understanding. And that person will come up, whoever it is. Sometimes you don't even have to say the statement. After you go through that, somebody will automatically come up. And when they do, then you say, I forgive you for not understanding. You might say that a few times and you will feel resentment coming up. Maybe you'll say, I forgive this resentment for being here. And I forgive you for ending. And eventually, it might take time. That's okay. But eventually, you accept what has happened. And you realize, as Umberto rightly said, that it had nothing to do with you. It was all about that person's habitual tendency. And so you accept that that was the case. And you let go of any resentment. The third part of that, that can happen, not all the time, but it can happen, is that that person might look at you in your mind. They might look at you and say to you, I forgive you, or I forgive you for not understanding. You might hear that in your mind, and you receive that, and you accept it, and that kind of closes the circle. Now, this practice, you don't have to do more than 30 minutes. 25 minutes is pretty much good. The other thing is the, the forgiveness walking practice is pretty straightforward. It's it's like a like a march that you do. It's it's like I so this is the right step, left step, right step, left step. I forgive you, you forgive me. Right? So it's you say that and it doesn't have to be longer than 15 or 20 minutes. And you do that, take a break. When you're ready to go back and sit, you do the same process. And you do that until the emotional quality of whatever that experience, whatever that emotion, uh, the memory was, whatever that situation was, starts to dissipate. So that when that memory does come up, it doesn't have any emotional value to it. It's not like uh, you don't feel anything. It's rather you just have acceptance and equanimity towards it. So the memory will still arise, but there won't be any clinging going on. No identification with it going on. That's how you know that you're ready to move on. And secondly... There will be an energetic shift in your body and in your mind. You will notice that there is a wellspring of joy that naturally arises. And that is a sure sign that you're ready to move on for the time being and continue with the regular practice. Okay, thank you. Could you just clarify, this is a big question, like uh, what is it, that you're not understanding and why don't you fill in the rest of that statement? I forgive myself for not understanding, but yet it's an open statement. Why is that? Yeah, this is important. It should be an open statement because otherwise you're trying to control the situation. You're controlling the meditation. You're like, I specifically forgive myself for doing this. No, no, no. Now you're actually uh, bargaining with what should be forgiven and what should not be forgiven. You're keeping it open-ended enough so that whatever is coming out from your subconscious is an uncontrolled, unconditioned, so to speak. Not to say that it's unconditioned. It means that it's not conditioned by your biases. It's just whatever will flow out, whatever will come up. So for you to try to direct the forgiveness towards something is actually you trying to control the situation. So keep it open-ended. Now, when that does arise, that some situation happened where you did not understand, and if it's specific, you can say in that moment, 
I forgive myself for not understanding this person's perspective, or I forgive myself for not understanding how I felt in that, for not accepting how I felt in that moment, or I forgive you for not understanding how I was feeling in that moment or what I was saying in that moment. But the, the thing that comes after the understanding doesn't really matter. It's all about letting go what does arise. You're not trying to analyze. You're not trying to, un, uh, to come to a point where now you have all of the therapeutic benefits of psychoanalysis. No, it's all about an emotional release that happens. And an emotional risk, a release can only happen when you take away the thinking, controlling mind out of the situation. Great, thanks. Um, okay, I think now we can take some questions or maybe some stories. It looks like, Josh, you've got your hand raised. So go ahead and unmute and let's hear what you have to say. Hi, thanks. Uh, first time here, I was late. Uh, other things. What I'm feeling into this is um, it works great. But at a certain point, though, I, what's coming up for me around this is um, I forgive you for not understanding then it's it's slipping into for me i'm better than the other person they're ignorant they're they're there there's ignorance here which there is and i'm better and more righteous than them and so they're lacking understanding or the reverse inferiority conceit where oh i'm ignorant i didn't understand which is you know somewhat true but feeling into and, and of course i can forgive both of those things but at, at a certain point i'm feeling like it's more beneficial to not even um, that that this is just a process. There's not me forgiving another person or, you know, on a relative level, of course there is, but, or vice versa. There's just this lack of wisdom that's involved in this, that's, that's driving, that have driven the behaviors, you know? And so just a, a more general notion of, of, okay, you know, there was a lack of understanding and wisdom here that led to the choices that were made and things that happened. So I don't know, that's, that's kind of how it's sitting. How, how would I, uh, is that okay to say, or how would this be addressed if I'm being, so, uh, if I understand? So um, yeah, I get what you're saying. And what I would say is if that's happening in that moment where you feel like, oh, there's an inferiority complex or there's a superiority complex, then just forgive that if that arises. To say, okay, I feel a little superior here. I'm going to forgive myself for feeling that way right now. Because the, the idea is you can try to use all of the theory of the Dhamma. You can try to use all of the understanding of the absolute, that this is an impersonal process and all of that. But none of that necessarily is going to make a meaningful, very frankly speaking, meaningful impact. Because the whole point of the forgiveness is because you took something personal to start off with. And so now, in order for you to come out of it, you there is a give and take. There is an exchange of forgiveness for yourself and for the other person. Yes, in the absolute sense, it's all, it's all just karma. It's all just vibration. It's all just experience that's impersonal. But try telling that to your heart. Try telling that to your emotions. Yeah, very good point. And the other thing I wanted to share real quick, I also heard about perceiving things in other people that will stir the heart, stir the chitta, that that I could actually forgive something in myself uh, that's that's even allowing that to happen to begin with and, and allowing uh, that perception of, of wrongness or something that's causing friction, that there's something, well, maybe maybe not but what what would it hurt anyway to forgive something in me that's that's uh having that uh, come to fruition to begin with so absolutely interesting absolutely. i mean when in doubt just keep forgiving even like front-loading forgiveness as long as it aligns with wise action like i already forgive you you could do anything right yeah. or to a certain degree yeah, that, that you're already forgiven it's it's pre-supposed uh, you know i could even yeah. almost get to that point <laughs> Yeah, and that's actually uh, touching upon compassion, because now you're recognizing, okay, the other person's suffering, so I don't need to add to their suffering, and I don't need to add to my suffering. Completely valid, completely fine. Steve. Thanks, David. 
Um, yeah, so my question is uh, around, you know, how we use the 6R process basically um, at the level of experiencing craving and then clinging and becoming and so on. And then once we reach that birth of action, basically, you know, karmic, uh, the karmic waterfall, and we really don't have a lot of opportunities to recall the arrow shooting towards the target at that point. Um, just wondering if if forgiveness practice provides another alternative, especially if we do that birth of action where we regret something, you know, we react and lash out or whatever, and we're like, oh, now there we go. What's coming next? Um, just just wondered your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, in the context of dependent origination, as you're saying, you know, with the birth of action, what does the birth of action cause? It causes suffering, and that suffering can manifest in regret. That's one of the things we see in the whole mass of suffering, that, that grief, despair, and, and so on and so forth. So that in itself is a feeling that you're experiencing in that moment. And you allow that feeling to be there and say, okay, I see this now. And I choose not to uh, repeat that same mistake. Or I choose not to repeat the same off offense. I forgive myself and I move on as best as I can. That's why I'm saying, and that's what I said earlier, which is that forgiveness is a great tool for releasing karma. Not in the sense that it somehow metaphysically burns karma, but in the sense that it brings you a level of understanding where you see that if I continue to behave in the same repeated habitual tendencies, it's only going to cause me more and more suffering. But if I choose to allow things to be as they are and I accept it, fine. In this moment, I slipped up. I said something I shouldn't have said. I did something I shouldn't have done. I slipped up. But the, the easier, or I should say the faster I'm able to recognize that, let that go. If I need to forgive myself, I forgive myself, forgive the other party. The easier it becomes to release that karma so that it doesn't happen again and again. And because you don't continue to dig into these channels of continual repeated behavior, they start to fade away. And they're replaced with deeper insight, deeper understanding, and ultimately more acceptance. Okay, Jordan. Nelson, thank you again for doing this wonderful uh, uh, session. Forgiveness was a big uh, piece in my practice and really was uh, the, the only way I could ever feel loving kindness. And then it just started pouring in. So it's like an unstoppable faucet of, of kindness yep. and friendliness now. So yeah, we're yep. so grateful for Bonte to doing this. But, uh, <clears throat> and I, I wanna thank Colm and the Freedom of Mind uh, organization for sponsoring this. Hey, thank you so much for doing this and uh, David. Okay, Sam, you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you, uh, Delson, for, for giving this talk. Um, so I guess my question is, um, I have two questions, actually. The first question is about the context and the, the feeling of forgiveness. Um, I was wondering if Delson could speak a little bit about that feeling of forgiveness and what that feels like versus loving kindness and um, how you separate the two and, and how you know that you're ready to switch back to loving kindness. Uh, and the second question was just a little, if, if you could talk a little bit about um, working in the context of therapy, if you have therapy or working through that um, in a secondary practice or with, with a professional um, how you tie that into either forgiveness or loving kindness and, and how the, the two can work together. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a good question because, um, you know, we talk about forgiveness and tr people try to hone in on what that feeling of forgiveness is. I don't want to give too much into it because then people will try to look for it, you know, but what I will say is as a result of forgiving, what you experience is a lot of release and a lot of relief. So the idea is to come to terms with what was happening, whether it was something you did, something somebody else did, or something that just arose. And it's a level of acceptance. It's a level of dropping it. It's a level of letting go. It's a level of, you know, seeing that your mind has clenched onto this for far too long. And then slowly, 
bit by bit. Have a lot of patience. It might take time, but if you have patience, it will see itself out. Is bit by bit, it starts to loosen up. And bit by bit, you do feel certain energetic shifts. You feel like there's a level of clarity in your mind. You feel like your body is looser. It's uh, it's uh, no longer too stiff, too tight. And uh, you feel relief. You know, that's the big thing with this practice, whether it's TWIM in general or whether it's forgiveness, is you want to experience a level of relaxation, of letting go, of dropping, of relief. The second part is that, you know, the thing about, you know, therapy is it has its benefits in uh, different ways. Uh, one of the, you know, I, I quoted uh, Albert Ellis, for example, and the reason I did that was because I studied him when I was 15 or 16, uh, rational emotive ther therapy and, uh, you know, related to that cognitive behavioral therapy. And, you know, what I found is, especially cognitive behavioral therapy, it has these things called cognitive distortions. And in some sense, they can be likened to unwholesome states of mind. And you rationalize those cognitive distortion, distortions by letting them go and replacing them with what seems to be the truth or what seems to be the reality of the situation by, by becoming less emotional about it and bringing in a more insightful perspective to the memory or the situation or whatever it is. That's the rational aspect of it. Uh, and by doing this, you are essentially practicing the six R's, whether you know it or not, because you're, you're recognizing the distortion, or you're recognizing the painful memory, or you're recognizing the hindrance. You're letting it go, you're relaxing it, you're replacing it. continuing it with loving kindness or whatever the wholesome state of mind is. So there is some overlap in that sense. But I do want to caution people to say that, you know, meditation should not be seen as a um, end-all, be-all cure for everything. It has its purpose. And the purpose of it is to gain insight that liberates you from your... Um, you know, your bondage, let's say, to samsara. I mean, for all intents and purposes, if we're very blunt about this, the Buddha talked about samsara as being uh, this prison. Like, we don't want to continue to be here anymore because it is painful, it is suffering. So we are using liberating insight, as it were, by this process of right effort, right mindfulness, right collectiveness, so that through that, we can experience complete freedom. And when we have complete freedom of mind, freedom of, from suffering, we are able to act spontaneously. We are no longer acting conditioned by our past projections. That is the great benefit of any practice rooted in the Dhamma. That allows you to see and allows you to let go and allows you to then replace it with something else. So there might be some overlap in some, certain therapies. But again, you know, we should not say that they are one and the same. They all, they each have their own uses. They can be complementary to each other, but doesn't mean that they need to, they need to be used in tandem all of the time. Okay, thank you. Maureen. Hi, uh, I love this topic. Um, I'm I'm engaged in forgiveness practice right now, and I have done it before, and that's why I'm doing it again. The first time um, was a few years ago, and the issue came up while I was on a retreat, and I was deep in meditation, and something very painful came up in the person. It, you know, blew me away, but I had guidance uh, from my teacher, and he directed me to this specific practice because it was so old and had been with me for so long it took a few months and it had to do with a parent who abused me who was also um, an alcoholic 
at the end, I mean, it was about four months, five months that I did this every day. And at the end of it, all I had was compassion for that man. He wasn't even my parent anymore. He was just another being who suffered. Hmm. And it changed, and it really changed a lot of my life to have that removed. And now I'm engaged in another practice of meditation with a um, a friend, and we had a different view of a particular situation. And this time I'm having a harder time getting to the, the other person. Uh, I'm forgetting. The forgiving myself, what comes up while I'm doing the forgiveness. Uh, I do this daily, the 30 minutes. But I'm just having a hard time. It's, I know it will it will occur. I just have to be patient. But she, the other person is not coming up. I, I, I'm The few other times I've done it, the up uh, comes up. And then I start to see them. And they soften. So I soften. Uh, um, and actually, I don't even know if I'm asking for your input, though I would love it, but I, I trust the experience because it's worked for me before, and I've never cried, though I've softened and softened and softened, and for me, the forgiveness then kind of turns into metta. Mm -hmm. At some point, it just starts to transition to metta rather than it opens. It's just a wonderful practice. Um, takes a lot of patience for me to to just wait, to trust, to trust. So I just wanted to add that uh, my experience has, has changed my life with the forgiveness meditation. So thank you. And thanks for having this talk, especially it's so serendipitous for me. Okay, thank you. Um, Delson, were you going to address that? the demand yeah i just wanted to yeah. point out what you said which is very important to see which is that forgiveness does invariably lead to compassion uh because that's the greatest understanding that you have is that person is suffering it has nothing to do with you personally although you were not you gen i mean specifically but anybody who is a uh a a uh, receiver of that pain and that that suffering you know, ultimately, you transcend that through compassion. Doesn't mean you condone what they did. Doesn't mean you agree with what they did. But you realize that that person, you know, was just not of right, uh, right action. They were they were not understanding themselves, and they had suffering. And so, seeing that and having compassion really is a great fruit of forgiveness. And I have seen that a lot with people. Is that it invariably does change to metta. It invariably does change to compassion, and that's a step in the right direction. That's one of the ultimate fruits of this practice. So, thank you for sharing. Okay, well, one thing I wanted to add was that you don't want to demand people come up. If they come up, they come up. If they don't, forget it. Move on. Just open the space. Let whoever comes in come in, because maybe that's not really the person you have to forgive. Your mind knows who it is. And just open the window and, and let them come in. So don't control. Yeah. Yvonne. Hi. Hi, Delson. Um, thank okay. you so much <laughs> for this uh, talk. I think I was badly need. <laughs> um, I just want to... Uh, tell a, a little bit about my experience with the six hours. It is a new thing for me, really new. Um, I start doing it because, you know, I said, no, I'm putting out all the other practice that I was doing was concentration. And uh, I was quite surprised. I was so... Um, I would say successful, you know, I was not expecting because in the beginning I could not feel loving kindness. But then, you know, I I start doing it, you know, follow the instructions, you know, uh, Bante gave so uh, and you gave. 
but then when I I don't know which John I feel was third, second, third. I, it was all those steps going that I never felt before. And then when it was uh, about to, to, when I start to be like equanimous, calm, then this feeling of sadness, uh, as if my heart, you know, was on the left side, but the, the right side was okay, was happy, but the left side, there was this pain. And I I tried to, it would go, and then it would come back, it go. And then I, when it would go, and then the mind would settle calmly and silent and, you know, very peaceful. But then the the pain on the left side came up again, and I six star, and I I thought of this forgiveness, but I didn't know how to do it. I never did it, never heard it, you know. Um, and now, um, can you just give me a little bit of instructions when it happens in a meditation that you go, and then at a certain point you stop, and then this kind of pain. It is something painful you know and I think what it is I think is that something that I'm regret doing when my son was really young I didn't know how to do you know how to deal with him um I think so you know this is one thing that comes up yeah uh, so in this case, I would say it's not important for you to continue with the same practice and then experience that equanimity and then that sadness again. Rather, you just keep that practice aside for the time being and just do forgiveness practice in earnest. So in this case, the instructions I gave were very simple, which is you start off with just saying these statements, I forgive myself for not understanding, and you just wait. And as David just said a little earlier, which is you don't control the process by directing it towards something, whether it was something to do with you and your son or whatever the situation might have been, try not to bring it up on your own. Let it come up automatically if that is the situation. And so if it is, then you just allow it to be there and you say, I forgive myself or I forgive this person, whatever it is. And you feel that regret starting to melt away. You don't try to make it go away, but you will feel it as you start to come to a deeper level of acceptance that it happened. And now I can move on. I can let it go and I can move on. So, um, you know, the short instructions, I think David are also on the website, on the Damasuka Library uh, page. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if somebody wants to link it to the chat yeah, we, or if it's we there. Put it in but there. We put it in there, yeah. yeah. So just set aside the, re the regular practice you're doing now and just do forgiveness for a little while until that sadness, that guilt melts away. And, you know, when you were giving instruction, I tried to do it together, you know, along with you. And I felt like crying, crying, yeah. crying, crying, you know. But then I stopped it because I want to listen to you. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, when it happens, what do you do? When it, when you want to cry? No, but you you just cry and and that's it. And that's it. It feels so good. You, I mean, you know, you, you shouldn't uh, <laughs> underestimate the power of a good cry. Also, it's an amazing release. Really, try it. Oh yeah, yeah, must be yeah because I didn't go on, you know. <laughs> so I don't know what would be you know the end of the crying. <laughs> You will find a lot of relief. Trust me, you will see a lot of relief. It's like as if you've just dropped a heavy load from your shoulders. Oh, okay. It'll be a kiss. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. You know, it occurs to me that crying perhaps is a natural way to let go of emotional stuff instead of bottling it up. I mean, it's, it's it's built in. It's like nothing wrong with crying. It's just it lets lets go of stuff. It's healthy, yeah. you know. 
It's healthy, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Alex. You know, there was. A, oh yeah, go, yeah. Ahead. go ahead. I mean, this is completely uh, off topic, but I'll talk about it anyway. Um, it's you know, there's that guy Osho. I don't know how many of you know him, but he uh, he was also by the name of Rajneesh, and he had a very interesting practice, a very interesting meditation that he would do. I'm not endorsing it, but I'm just explaining what the, the, the whole process is. Maybe you'll get some insights into it. Uh, it was called the Mystic Rose Meditation. A very interesting meditation. And it was a, it was a three-week program where for one week, every day, for three days, all you would do is you would laugh. You would try to bring yourself to some kind of laughter. Think about something funny. Try to you know imagine something funny and just keep laughing, keep laughing, keep laughing for those three hours as best as you can. And then the next week, all you would do is you would cry and you would release all of this emotional baggage. So in the beginning, you'd feel all of this uh, childlike joy, and then you'd go deeper and you experience the grief, and you you know you would you would uh, take it out from the process of crying. And then the third week was just a week of silence. So three hours every day, you would be in silence, just observing things as they are. So the benefits of a good laugh, the benefits of like a hearty belly laughter, you know, should not be uh, underestimated, nor should a good cry, you know? So that is why even Bhante would always emphasize, like, make sure you have a good time. Make sure you enjoy yourself stop taking things personally stop taking them so seriously you know if you laugh at the craziness of your mind and what brings what comes up you will start to come into a level of of awareness where you don't take it personal and you realize oh it's just the mind and so laughter is very important crying is very important and silence which is the ultimate fruit of this whole process where you come into a level of quietude where you can see things as they are. Anyway, let's continue. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me address that. Uh, honestly, I have no idea what Bonte was saying or the context behind what Bonte was saying. I can't speak for Bonte. Bonte is long gone. So, you know, if Umberto wants to speak on it, he can. But whatever Bonte said, first of all, we have to understand one thing. Not everything Bhante said was necessarily always uh, accurate. He was only human. Yeah. Uh, so if he said something, he might have said it in a larger context around something related to the Dhamma. Uh, but I don't think he was necessarily attacking people for their depression or whatever they were experiencing. He might have said it in a different context. What I will say about depression is that it's something that... Um, you don't even know you are in necessarily because it's so deep because it's so um it's so heavy and depression can manifest in many different ways you might not even be aware of it sometimes and the only thing you can do is to try to see in the moment okay here is an experience i'm not experiencing joy again i'm not saying everybody needs to experience joy all the time in the same way, not everybody needs to be sad all the time or upset all the time. But there is a certain quality to depression that, that drains the energy, that drains the system. And the only way to start to let that go is by using certain kinds of therapies, if that helps. Meditation doesn't need to be the cure to depression. I don't condone, I don't uh, accept that because depression might be a symptom of something that's even deeper, right? So I think a person should see for themselves what seems most appropriate and go in that direction. Something that just is simply not being understood, call it ignorance, delusion, whatever. So yeah, I just, yeah, thank you for that. So I just wanted to unpack it. Yeah. I'll just say one more thing, which is, and this doesn't need a response, but it's just a comment on what you mentioned, which is um, compassion. I mean, you know, that is really the, the 
the mindset of somebody fully awakened. Compassion and wisdom. These are the two wings upon which the mind of somebody who is fully awakened um, exists, let's say, or function. And compassion uh, doesn't try to analyze, doesn't try to, uh, doesn't try to in investigate. It's just compassion for the sake of being compassionate. Doesn't even try to solve the other pro person's problems. Doesn't try to be a savior. Doesn't try to say, I feel bad for you and I want to help you by taking you out of that situation. No, it doesn't do that either. It's just a recognition of the other person's suffering and having true um, empathy, understanding for that person's situation and being available. You can just be there as a presence. Some people just want to be heard. Majority of people just want to be heard and recognized. And doing that in itself is compassion. That's compassion in action. We don't always have to try to take on other people's problems. We don't always have to try to say, you know, hey, if you thought about it this way, or maybe you should go this way or whatever. No, sometimes it helps to just be there and they just unload whatever is going on and they feel better that way. And you, by, by us being compassion, uh, compassionate, we don't take that. Whatever they're saying is their stuff. We understand that. We recognize it's their suffering and we're allowing ourselves to be an open vessel. But okay, fine. Say what you need to say to me. I'm here. I'm lending you my full attention. Please go ahead. And that's always, that's sometimes all that's needed. Perfect. I think sometimes people just want us to listen. And and don't yeah. don't tell us what to do. Just listen, and that's it. And it's enough. And then they hear themselves, and they figure it out. Yeah, there you go, Daniela. Okay, um, I'm listening, and um, thank you very much for being here. And I'm saying hello to Anne and to John, who I know from Ken's um, uh, Sunday meetings. Um, when you are in a situation where family continues to sort of goad you and and upset you and it's you have compassion for people who are intel, intentionally setting you up can you continue to be compassionate when it, instead of confronting continue to be compassionate to people who are continually trying to set you up for a reaction and the reaction is hurtful, like their intentions are hurtful. And you know that it's intentional, it's not an accident, it's not ignorant, it's, it's intentionally picking on something that would hurt you and they do it in a good way and it's effective. Do you continue to be compassionate? Because it's family, I don't want to drop them, but it's really hard to continue to be abused um, intentionally. Uh, every time. Do you understand? Yeah. Do, are you, am I, I understand. Understand? Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. And uh, what I would say to that is, uh, first, we have to understand this from a karmic perspective, which is that what people say to us to instigate or to, to create a reaction out of us is their karma. It's their active karma, whatever they're doing. And how we choose to respond to that is our karma. So it shouldn't be about the other person. We don't want to give power to the other person, so to speak, control to the other person through our reactions. So being non-reactive, easier said than done. I know, easier said than done. But coming from a place of non-reactivity is very beneficial. And sometimes all that requires is not compassion. It's not compassion at all. It's yes, for a level, for, for, for a certain level, it's like, okay, I understand that they're suffering and that's all them, that's all their problem. But now what you have to instill in your mind is equanimity. Uh, yeah. Uh, equanimity. Okay. Coming back full circle to why I initiated meditation in my life in the first place. Thank you, Delsa. Thank you very much. Okay, great.
Anything else from anyone? Are there any questions in the chat? Uh, no, just bunches of comments here and there, so. Hello, hi, Dawson. So good to see you. I'm so happy. Um, so the forgiveness meditation, you would not mix it then. You would not sit like, say, in the morning you do half an hour of uh, um, forgiveness and then in the afternoon you go to the normal meditation. You would just stick to it. Is it so? And then would it be helpful to like, rather than one time, do it longer, do it three times? Half an hour or so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, this is a good point. I would not mix practices. I would just do forgiveness alone uh, until you're ready to move on completely you know, towards metta or any other Brahma Vihara. And better to do 20 or 25 minutes of practice three times a day or four times a day or whatever seems feasible than to do longer periods. Definitely don't want to do more than 30 minutes at a time when it comes to forgiveness practice. Uh, because it just uh, loses steam after that. It just becomes very stale. Uh, and it's like you have to force it. Like 25 minute increments uh, are probably the best approach to this. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, a question from the chat. Um, we forgive something and it's kind of done for a little while. And then a month later, it comes back. And we forgive it, and then it comes up. Well, how do we know when we're done with it? When there's no more emotional reaction to that memory. There's no more content that causes some uh, feeling of resentment, a feeling of anger, a feeling of hurt from that memory. Um, I'll, I mean, I, I'll just say, you know, even in the suttas, the Buddha says, the perfection of loving kindness is that there is no longer even an iota of ill will present in the mind, which means not even a single moment uh, of mind thinking about that person in a resentful or angry way. That's the perfection. That means you have perfected loving kindness, likewise with compassion, likewise with joy and equanimity. So with forgiveness in the same way, you know you're done with that situation or that person or that incident or whatever when there's not even a single iota of resentment, guilt, remorse, or whatever it might be. Okay, perfect. Kashmira. Thank you for your talk, Dalton. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I have a question which sometimes I do not understand. Uh the tightness in my system or in my body, like let's say there is a lump in my throat or somewhere, is it because of an unresolved issue in the past? Because I really don't have, uh, I cannot say I have an emotional thing. All I know that this is something that is I feel right now, but is it because of an unresolved past issue or is it really my body just not uh, physical condition? Uh, so, how do you uh, can you help how we navigate through something like that? Yeah, I think it's better that you check if it's a physical condition or not first. And I'm saying this specifically to you because we've had this discussion before in past retreats. You know, uh, so it might be uh, it might warrant you to actually check if it's a physical thing before we further investigate if there's an emotional or mental quality to that thing. Yeah, just to follow up on that is that. In my last retreat, what happened was after doing, uh, it was not a forgiveness practice, just the, the usual, mm -hmm. you know, of jhana practice. After sometimes, after coming out of a sit, my body feels like all the pain has just disappeared. And uh, so I wonder if the same thing happens when you do forgiveness, or is it just that jhanas help release such good, you know, a lot of your. Uh, right kind of hormones and uh, balance your system so you feel good. Uh, I don't know. seems like both work to, to me. Maybe it was giving you temporary relief because, you know, we've heard, yeah. heard stories in suttas where the Buddha had excruciating back pain and he'd go into the fourth jhana for temporary relief from that. So 
maybe that's what it was. But in any case, uh, I think it might warrant you to just check if it's not some kind of a physical situation. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, Ivan. Uh, just uh, coming back to this um, other meditation that you talk about, uh, Brahma Viharas, uh, it, not that I want to start doing it, you know, all the other ones, but are they in the Damasuka uh, site? Yes, they are. Uh, you would probably want to, when you're ready to do like an online retreat or something, just look at the website and you'll see what retreats are available for Brahma Viharas or for forgiveness. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, I, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we have retreats going on all the time, so feel free to sign up. Okay, I'll have a look. All right. <laughs> um, okay, I think, have we come to the end of questions now? Looks that way. Looks like we're going to be sharing some merit here. All right. All right. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. All right. I will see you guys when I see you, whenever that will be. All right. Thank you very much. For another Thanks for coming, talk. everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Delson. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Delson. Thank you, Delson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delson. Isn't kind of strong. Thank you, Delson. Thank you. Thank you.